everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm super excited. I have with us Steve Taylor, and he has um, recently, well, he will have a book out in November, and I read it. It's an excellent read called The Psychology of Time Perception and the Illusion of Linear Time, Time Expansion Experiences. So we're going to be talking about that today and so much more. Steve, thank you so much for joining us. I'm so excited to be able to speak with you. Great to be here, likewise. Thank you. So if you could give us a little bit of background, you have a very impressive background. Tell folks a little bit about who you are and some of the books that you wrote. That would be a great way to get started. I think myself as a spiritual psychologist. I'm a, I'm a psychologist who investigates uh, spirituality, spiritual experiences, and near-death experiences and psychic experiences uh, from an open-minded perspective. Because I've had those sort of experiences myself all through my life, um, and I'm, I'm the author of about six, I think sixteen books now on psychology and spirituality, and um, based, partly based on my research, also based on my own experiences. Um, I'm also a poet. I've written three books of poetry, and I'm a I'm a university researcher and lecturer here in the UK. Um, let's talk about your new book that's coming out. You said in November, correct? That's right. I I found that absolutely amazing uh, read, and as I mentioned to you before, I'm definitely going to reread it. You open up a, uh, with a story about a car accident. Let's explain. First, to folks, what time expansion experiences are like, and what prompted you to write this book? It's just so they can have some clarity. Yeah, sure. It, it was my own experience. It was uh, um, around about almost ten years ago. Um, I had a car crash. I was driving along the highway here in Manchester in the UK on the uh, mo motorway we call it, and um, I was trying to overtake a truck. But the truck didn't see me, so the truck moved out and bashed me, crashed into me. And my car started to spin round on the highway. It was a busy highway, a lot of cars around. We were probably traveling at maybe 70 kilometers per hour, maybe 50, 55 miles per hour. Uh, so I thought, I thought I was going to be seriously injured. But immediately, as soon as the car hit me, as soon as the truck hit me, I went into a different state of consciousness. Uh, time slowed down, everything went very quiet, um, and I looked behind, and the cars behind me seemed to be kind of frozen, as if time had stopped altogether. My perception became very acute, very heightened, so I could see the faces on all these drivers, because all these drivers looking really shocked, thinking, oh no, he's going to have a serious accident. And but, but I felt amazingly calm as well, and I felt as though I had a lot of time to think about the situation and to try to take some preventative action. So I thought very methodically, what should I do? Okay, this, this could be a serious accident. Is there anything I can do to, to sort of um, mitigate the danger, to alleviate the danger? And it was amazing. It probably lasted in reality. I mean, my car spun around a few times. And fortunately, we span in the direction of the crash barrier. There was like an empty lane. We call it the hard shoulder. It's an empty lane. Uh, in case of any emergencies, my, my car went in that direction and crashed into the barrier. It was probably like maybe six, five, six seconds in reality. But in my mind, in my consciousness, it felt like uh, maybe 45 seconds to a minute. I felt there's had so much time to perceive what was happening and to contemplate the situation and consider what the best course of action was. And luckily, you know, I was I was unharmed. My wife was in the car too. She was unharmed. So it felt like a miracle that we were unharmed. But it was, it was definitely a, a heightened state of awareness, an altered state of consciousness. So that encouraged me to do more research. So I began to collect experiences, similar experiences, not just from car accidents, but also from other kinds of emergencies like uh, fires, uh, earthquakes, uh, falls, but also people who were in a state of deep meditation and time disappeared people who took psychedelic substances and had a, a time expansion experience. So I found out that there are many different contexts in which what I call time expansion experiences can occur. And, and later I began to research other areas like I call, uh, there's another variant of the experience which I call time cessation experiences, when time just disappears altogether. 
So these time expansion experiences, are they, in, in your opinion, are they altered states of time or is it just the way we as an individual are experiencing that? Because not everybody has the, those types of experiences. So like, why is that? Mm -hmm. Why is it that only certain people experience this slowdown or speeding up of time? Time is, is very flexible. There's no such thing. I mean, we have a normal way of perceiving time, which comes from our normal state of consciousness. But as soon as we shift into a different state of consciousness, time changes. And usually when we go into a very dramatically altered state of consciousness, time slows down drastically. So it's true that, you know, some people are, have accidents but don't have a time expansion experience. Some people, you know, meditate but don't have a time expansion experience. And so it depends on the person. Some people are more susceptible to altered states of consciousness than others. Um, you know, so I guess people who are who are creative, who are intuitive, who have psychic experiences, those kind of people are more susceptible to altered states of consciousness. Therefore, you know, they're probably more likely to have time expansion experiences. Does time actually slow down during these times or is it just our perception of it? Well, some people have argued that time expansion experiences are just a, a kind of illusion caused by memory. That you know, the the argument is that you know when we have these experiences, they create a lot of memories. So when we look back to them, when we look back at them from the future, they you know they appear to have lasted longer just because we have more memories from them. But I don't think that that's the case. I think time actually does slow down, and and, and one reason for that is that in these experiences, people do you have more time to take action there are so many stories about people so many stories i've collected from people who were in emergency situ emergency situations like for example a fire there's one story i collected from a woman whose children were, were caught, caught caught in a fire she was outside the house and the house went uh, the house was on fire so she ran into the house and she again she was in a despite the the danger she was in a very rational calm state of mind and she felt as though time expanded and allowed her to save her children. She, she felt as though she had a lot of time to contemplate the best course of action, to be careful and to run around the house collecting her three children. And, you know, there are so many stories like that also from car crashes when people have to take some sort of preventative action, motorcycle crashes. Also falls, so many stories from falls when people feel that they have time to position themselves, to minimise the danger, you know, to turn themselves around so that they're, they're you know, there's less risk of injury. So people, every almost everybody feels that they have more time to take preventative action, and also to to contemplate the situation, to think about what what to to plan the best course of action. So I mean, I think people in these situations, people actually do take courses of action which would be impossible in a normal you know in a normal time frame. If it really was just three or four seconds, they wouldn't be able to do all the things that they do or to think about all the, thing, the things that they think about. So I'm sure that a lot of these moments are now caught on video, these car accidents, sporting accidents, things like that. Um, have you looked at the mm. video correlation? Like is time slowing down for everyone or just that person? Like how does that work? There are some situations where, for example, in car accidents, when there's say two passengers in a car, they they can both maybe they will both experience a time expansion, but not always. Sometimes it's just one person in the car will experience it. But there are there are cases when people experience it collectively. Um, but that that's I'd say that's that's quite uncommon. But there there are yeah as you say there are some video video footage. There's one that one guy who I interviewed he he had um, he was caught up in a serious train accident when his, his coat was caught in the doors of a train was closing. So the train pulled him along the track and he was eventually pulled underneath the train. So the so the, the video footage, he studied the video footage, which showed that around 10 seconds passed when he was pulled along the platform, then he disappeared under the train. But in his mind, it was as if those 10 seconds were two, three minutes. Wow. You know, so there is, there's always this mismatch between time as it is measured and time as it is experienced in these situations.
how is it that some folks can actually recall a lifetime's worth of memories in those, you know, during these time expansion experiences? How does that, how do, how do you account for that? That is probably the most extreme form of time expansion, which which can happen. And it normally happens in um, near-death experiences or when people are close to death, or when they are you know, in the middle of a fall, when they've fallen off the, the first floor of a building, for example, or fallen off the side of a mountain. So in those few seconds, people can literally relive every single experience of their lives. And it's called that's why it's called the life review. And it's not just a question of memory. It's not just a question of people, of memories sort of popping into people's minds. It is actually a question of reliving experiences as if those experiences are still there, as if they're still alive. So it's, it's almost as if um, some people describe it as their whole life is like a kind of landscape, like a panorama. And they're just looking over this panorama, you know, from birth to the present moment. Sometimes in the future as well, there are, there are cases of people who, review their future experiences or have images of some of their future experiences. So, you know, it's, it's a very big question about how, you know, how is it possible, as you say, how is it possible for a person to relive, say, 40 years of experiences in three or four seconds? And uh, so the, the only way to explain it really is that, you know, this is what I suggest in the book, that the time, linear time is an illusion, and that in reality, the past is still there, it's still extant, it's still alive. And the future is already here. It's somehow already there in front of us alongside the present. So, you know, the only way you can explain it is that, you know, it does become a kind of panorama and you can just have this overview of the panorama. Yeah, because you mentioned that, like, the past, the present and the future are really happening all at one time, right? Mm -hmm. Isn't that part yeah, of Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I think that that that's what the the evidence points to. You know, I, I look into evidence from physics as well. You know, there's the idea in physics that of space time, that space, sorry, that time is like space. It's kind of spread out in front of us. Mm -hmm. um, so that's sometimes called the block universe. And there's evidence from quantum physics as well that somehow uh, the present can affect the past, the future can affect the present. So it is it is almost as if Time is an illusion, and that in reality, past and the future uh, are here now alongside the present. Do you think that's what accounts for intuition as well? I think it accounts for precognition. Yeah, you possibly right. intuition as well when, when you sense that something, yeah, that something may happen, that something, unless you take some, for, some, some sort of preventative action, that something will occur. Yeah, yeah, because the only way of explaining that kind of awareness of the future is to say that the future, in some sense, already exists. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, you talk about, in later into the book, because we're kind of hopping all over the place, but that's fine, um, about free will. And, you know, we're always told that we have free will. And I've read studies where they've done experiments to show that we really don't have free will, like they do these MRI scans and mm. lots of times the decision we make, we're not really in control of that these decisions mm. are already made for us. We think we have free will, but we don't. What's your mm. take on, on free will and these time expansion experiences? Yeah, it's a, uh, it's a conundrum mm. because, um, you know, if, if, as we say, the future already exists, then then in a sense we have no free will because our right. experiences are preordained and whatever we choose to do it's all preordained you know so there's there's nothing we can do to change the future we can think that we're going to change change the way we live or what we do but in reality it's all preordained it was preordained that we changed it that we changed our course of action but on the other hand um there does seem to be some room for personal choice uh, there does seem to be some room for free will because uh, it, it, it doesn't seem to be the case that the future is set in stone. It seems to be more like probability. Mm. You know, it, it seems to be like, you know, there, there are different possibilities in, in terms of the future and only certain possibilities may eventualize. It's almost like there are kind of variations. 
And you, you can tell that from there are some precognitive experiences. You know, for, for example, it's not uncommon for people to have precognitive experiences about danger. You know, maybe let's say, for example, a child has a precognitive dream. This is actually a real case where a child had a precognitive dream where he was, he was cycling in the countryside and he saw himself hit a tree, cycle straight into a tree and have a serious accident. So the next day, he was cycling in the countryside and he saw the tree and thought, oh, that's a tree for my dream. I better swerve away. So he swerved away and didn't have a serious accident. So that suggests that the future is not, you know, if, if, you, if the future had been set in stone, then he would have crushed into the tree. Um, so there seems to be some room for manoeuvre. Also, there are some near-death experiences where people are told, you know, if you return to your body, this is what will happen in your life. But of course, people can choose not to return to their body, in which case it wouldn't happen. Right. So I, I think there is some room for free will. And I do believe in free will to an extent. Yeah, um, I, I tend to believe that too. But it, it it gets into the whole if you believe in God or not, you know, depending on your religious beliefs too. Because God did say he granted us free will too. So it gets into that whole aspect of it as well. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a tricky one, but I mean, yeah, philosophers, yeah. philosophers have puzzled over free will for, for thousands of years. Yeah, absolutely. We're, we're not going to solve the we're not going to solve the question. No, I don't think so. But it's good that we're asking the questions, right? Yeah, that's right. Um, you also ask questions in your book, like uh, why does time seem to speed up as we get older? Like why does it seem to speed up when we're enjoying ourselves or in um, like a state of absorption? Mm. So how do you account for those moments? They're, they're actually, they're actually, believe it or not, quite easy to explain. Um, th there's a strong connection between time perception and the amount of information that our minds take in, and that's why you know you, you. I think most of us have had the experience of going to a foreign country or some kind of unfamiliar place, and then you return after a few days. It feels like more than you know, more than a week has passed. You feel like you've been away for quite a long time. You know, I, I can remember going to India a long time ago and I had so many intense experiences traveling around India for, for four weeks that when I came back I felt like I'd been away for four months or even four years you know rather than four weeks and uh, because new experiences stretch time uh, and that's because new experiences or new environments bring us a lot of new information you know new sights new sounds new tastes smells new languages new buildings everything's new so a lot of information goes into our minds. But if you're in your familiar environment, you know, then, then, then time will go quickly because you're not having any new experiences. It's all familiar. Yeah, that makes and and that, that helps to explain why time goes quick, slowly for children because, because children are living in a world of newness and therefore time is massively stretched out for them. They're experiencing everything for the first time. But as you get older, you, you have fewer new experiences. The world becomes more familiar. So I, I think that's the main reason why time seems to speed up because there's less, every year there seems to be less new information, fewer new experiences, fewer new perceptions, fewer new sensations. So it, it is possible to, to, you know, to stop that happening to a degree by, by making sure that, you know, you, you live quite adventurously and you always make sure you're, you're, you're always curious, you're always investigating new things, traveling to new places meeting new people, that will stop time speeding up, at least to an extent. And the, the, the other question you mentioned was about why time goes quickly when we're enjoying ourselves. And that, that's a slightly different thing, but it's related to that question because it's, it's about absorption. When we enjoy ourselves, we get absorbed. You know, our minds focus in on the activity or the place where we are, and absorption makes time pass quickly. Um, because absorption means that we narrow our attention down to a, a particular focus and therefore there's less new information. And also our, our minds become very quiet as well. When we're bored, our minds are very busy. There's lots of, there are lots of thoughts flowing through our mind and there are therefore a lot of information passing through our mind, which stretches time. But when our minds become, when we become absorbed, our minds become quiet and therefore there are fewer thoughts passing through our, through our minds. Uh, when people meditate, do they feel that sense of 
time slowing down or does it speed up for them? Like when they're done meditating, do they feel either way? That's a tricky one, actually, because medica me medication, <laughs> meditation, that's true of medication too, actually, but meditation can affect time perception in different ways. Um, I think the, mo the most normal change in time perception that occurs in meditation is that people feel that time goes quickly because meditation is really a state of absorption. Your mind becomes quiet. It gets absorbed in your mantra or your breathing or whatever. But sometimes when people finish meditating, they're in a heightened state of awareness because uh, they're, then they're in a state of mindfulness and every, everything looks real and kind of fascinating and things look more beautiful than normal. And that make that can make time slow down because it's, you know, you're, you're taking in more new information. Yeah. And that and actually, actually there can be a, a deep state of meditation, a very deep state of meditation in which time can seem to disappear. You know, it may, it may give rise to a, a time cessation experience. What about awakening experiences? You know, those moments where it's almost like euphoric. I mean, I've had a few of those in my life and they're extraordinary to mm. experience. And um, it's it's weird because I had one that I tried to, to get to reoccur by doing the same thing, thinking that it would reoccur. And you have like no control over it. But it's such a transformative experience. What what are those awakening experiences? I, I've done a lot of research on awakening experiences. They they are they are moments of intensified awareness, moments in which our awareness expands, the world becomes more real, and we feel a sense of connection or even unity towards our surroundings, to nature, to other people, a sense of love and compassion for other people. So it's, it's, a, it's a really um, a dramatic intensification and deepening of, of awareness. And, that, and they, they, they can affect time as well. Uh, it depends on the intensity that, you know, there are, there are certain you know, awakening experiences which are, are fairly common, which people feel when they're in nature, maybe when they're swimming, um, you know, so sometimes uh, in meditation or maybe when they're praying at church or whatever. Right. Um, and th those uh, those can bring a sense of presence, a sense that, that people become very present to the future and the past no longer seem to exist. And th there's just a sense that the now is the only reality and everything else is insignificant. But in, um, in kind of deeper or more intense awakening experiences, there can be a sense that the material world seems to kind of dissolve away and reveal a kind of fundamental spiritual force or energy, which is the essence of all, all things. And when that happens, there's a sense that all time is here. You know, the mystics call it the eternal now or the timeless moment. A sense that, you know, somehow, as I said before, the past and the future are here now in the present, as if time becomes panoramic. Hmm. Well, time is a, a man-made thing, isn't it? Wasn't it? invented basically by humans what when is the first historical um proof of that when did we actually start because i i i know i read it somewhere like when clocks became you know a thing but when did time become so prevalent to human beings and and what do you think accounted for that because we're obsessed with time we are yeah, yeah. I think you could you can make a distinction between you could say duration. I mean, all all things have duration. Right. The human body has a duration. Our lives have a duration. Uh, you know, the seasons have a duration. The day has a duration before it turns into night. But yeah, time is something slightly different. Time is measurement. You could say that time is measurement of duration, maybe. But um, the the first the first people who seem to have started to measure time were the Sumerians. Maybe four thousand years ago, they invented sundials. And ancient right. Egypt used sundials as well, but it was only really with the only really with the industrial revolution, which I guess was maybe two hundred years ago now. That's when people started to become obsessed with time. That's when time became standardised, you know, around countries. It, it, you know, two hundred years ago, the time in say Manchester, where I live, would be different from the time in London, two hundred miles away. But but when trains started to run, then people realised they had to standardise time. Right.
So time became standardized across whole countries and then across whole continents. But um, yeah, I think um, I think prehistoric humans and maybe some of the world's indigenous peoples don't really don't really live in a world of time. You know, the, I've heard about some indigenous peoples who don't have any future tenses in their languages or any words that refer to the future because they they just live in the present. You know, the future is meaningless to them. But yeah, we, but we live in a world of linear time and we're obsessed with the future and the past. Right. Um, what what do you think um, during these awakening experiences that we have them? Why are they so fleeting? In other words, like you'll have this experience and it'll it'll impact you for a little bit, and then speaking of time, as time goes by, they seem to lose their importance and and you can't seem to recapture that. Is that like a brain Ooh. chemical thing, like a dopamine experience? Is it is it like is it a spiritual thing? What is it exactly? I I wouldn't explain it in neurological terms. I think it's a psychological thing. I think um, we have a certain sort of mindset, you could say. I, I sometimes call it the self system. It's like made up of psychological processes, like um, you know, memory, identity, attention. And it kind of creates our normal state of being, our normal sense of identity. But there are certain situations where, where this self-system dissolves away, like in deep meditation, maybe in deep relaxation when you're in the countryside, sometimes under the influence of psychedelics. And, and in those moments, the normal self-system dissolves away. And suddenly we're, you know, we're in a different reality. We have a different identity. The world seems to be a different place. We're not seeing the world through filters of familiarity. And we're not perceiving ourselves uh, through our normal concepts. So all of the normal concepts that through which we see the world just fade away. And suddenly, wow, it's this amazingly different and intensely real place. The world becomes, you know, totally different. But it doesn't normally, as you say, it doesn't normally last for long. It's not long before our normal self system sort of re, re, right. remolds itself, if you like. It kind of reinstates itself. It's a bit like um, knocking over. Imagine you knock over, a, you know, a house of cards, but then the house of cards miraculously rebuilds itself after a few seconds. It, you know, it's well, like one of those. I'm thinking of one of those candles. You blow out a candle, and it just well, the, you know those candles that re reignite themselves after a few yes, seconds. Yes. That's what it's like. So, so yeah, and, and then then we're, we're back in a normal reality. We think, oh no. Where did that? Where did that reality? Where did that intense state of consciousness go? So obviously, we we we, we want to try and recapture it, yes. and you can. I think you can recapture it to a degree. You know, I think you can go through a long term process of spiritual awakening, which would eventually, maybe, you know, return you to that state of awareness, and that and then it would be your your normal awareness at least to some degree. I think that is possible, even though it's. It probably doesn't happen very often, but it is definitely possible. That'd be great. What about um, uh, people? People's obsession now, I call it, because even in my personal life, I've met people that either want to do ayahuasca or have mm. done it. Um, what do you yeah, think is accounting for for that? That everybody all of a sudden wants this instant awakening, but but yet the people that have done ayahuasca. That awakening stays, it seems to stay with them, like through their life. Does it? I know at least two people that have been transformed. I don't mean the state mm. of it, but I mean, it's it's yeah. transformative. Oh, that's what you mean. It's transformed yeah. their lives. Yeah, well, I think in itself, it's probably quite a healthy impulse because it's an impulse to to experience, you know, to have an awakening experience. It's an impulse to expand your consciousness and, and transform yourself. And, and I think that's the important role of uh, psychedelic substances. They can give people a glimpse of this heightened reality. You know, it's, in a way, it's a kind of shortcut because other people may meditate for, for years to try to reach the same place. But I mean, but why not if it's there? And if you if you want to get there right. quickly, then it, it doesn't do it. You know, there's no then I don't have a problem with that. But I don't, I don't think it works when people do it regularly, though. You know, I've met people who take ayahuasca regularly yes. and it seems to have a negative effect to them i don't think you should rely on you know 
plants or external substances to create a heightened state of awareness. Right. You have the means to do it yourself. So I think, you know, it's great to get a glimpse of that heightened awareness, but I don't think ayahuasca or any psychedelic substance can actually take you there on a permanent basis. You know, that I think, you know, in a way, psychedelics can be a little bit misleading because they show you where you need to get to, but they don't actually give you the means of getting there. You know, right. you, can't, you can't get there by regularly taking psychedelics. If anything, it will you know, dissolve your self system in a negative yeah. way. Yeah, I could see where it would do that. Yeah, so I like what, you know, you remember Alan Watts? You, yes, you, absolutely. He's yeah, awesome. He, I love him. He's awesome. But he said about psychedelics, somebody asked him, you know, what's your opinion of psychedelics? And he said, in his very posh English voice, he said, um, when you get the message, hang up. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> That's good. I like that. I like that. Um, let's talk about NDEs a little bit. I've interviewed so many people that have had that type of an experience of, of a near death experience. And each one is so different and unique and they have some similarities that, that cross over. And, you know, some people will, will have a religious NDE and some people will not, they will have a spiritual NDE, but they all talk about time being non-relative like there's no sense of time mm. during this nde the last gentleman i spoke with i think he said he had he was in an ambulance and i think he was gone for maybe 10 seconds while they were trying to bring him back and he said it could have been hours like during his nde mm. it felt like hours to him and when he described what happened to him 10 seconds would not have been nearly enough time to yeah. talk about the adventure that, that he went through. So, so mm. where does NDEs fit into this whole thing? In my book, I suggest that NDEs, you know, they, they can bring about the most radical type of time expansion that human beings can ever experience. Because as, as, as I said before, car accidents, in car accidents, time can... Uh, time can slow down maybe like 40 or 50 times so that two seconds can seem like over a minute or something like that. But in near-death experiences, that kind of time expansion, you know, just ex you know, increases massively to the point where a few minutes can seem like a few hours or even a few days. So it's a much more radical form of time expansion. And as you say, there, there are two variants really in near-death near experiences. Near -death experiences. Some people say that time just disappears there's no such thing as time, and they have no idea how long the experience has lasted because it doesn't seem important. Um, but there are also experiences where time becomes panoramic. It doesn't cease to exist. You know, it's, it's like it's like the first variant is saying there's no time, but in the second variant, it's all time. You know, all time is there. All past, all future experiences are there in this kind right. of panoramic landscape. That's why people sometimes have visions of their future lives. And they're told, you know, if you go back, this is what will happen in your right. life. And they can see the future. So, yeah, it, it's and I think near-death experiences, they, they do help to reveal to us that time is illusory, that our normal awareness of time is illusory. And you, know, you, you could say that, in a sense, near-death experiences are a, a very radically altered state of consciousness. So they're not too dissimilar from a state of a psychedelic experience or a state of deep meditation or even a car accident in the sense that they're all altered states of consciousness. But because near-death experiences are, you know, a very dramatically altered state of consciousness, they bring about a very dramatically altered uh, experience of time. Do you personally believe in them or do you think it's yes. a neurochemical thing in the brain? No? No, that, I'm aware of... I've done a lot of research on this. I've written about near-death experiences a lot. And I've read almost, I think I've read every attempt to explain near-death experiences in neurological or physiological terms. And in my view, every one of them is hopelessly flawed. There are major problems with all of them. Mm. Uh, so uh, there's no, there is no reliable or valid way of explaining near-death experiences in, in neurological terms. So I think, you know, it seems clear to me that they are authentic experiences. Wow. You you also mentioned, and I've heard this so many times before, where doctors um, were shocked because these patients would 
rise above their bodies and see what was going on in their surroundings. Mm. And a lot of doctors had, would be shocked that they were, they would not have been able to know something like that. So. Yeah, that's why it's really revealing that almost every major investigator or researcher into NDEs is a medic. You know, that they're all uh, intensive care unit, uh, nurses, cardiologists, and so forth. Because and the only reason they've become interested in these experiences is because their patients kept telling them about them. And they're, they're you know, they're, they're all convinced that they are authentic experiences because they've witnessed them countless times in their patients. What about consciousness and the brain? Um, do you believe that like our essence is in our brains or is it more in our entire entity and who we are? How is the brain responsible for any of our spirituality if that's where consciousness is? Um, I'm not sure that it is. Um, I mean, it's a kind of a common assumption that the brain produces consciousness. Mm -hmm. But, I, but I, I think now, you know, you know after 30, 40 years of 40, 30, 40 years of research and 30, 40 years of theorizing about how the brain could produce consciousness, I think we can actually disregard the idea that the brain produces consciousness. Um, I think there's, there's very little evidence for it now. And there are so many, you know, so many different theories which kind of contradict each other about how the brain could produce consciousness. None of the theories have been shown to be evidential. So I, I think we need to start looking for a different way of explaining consciousness. And it, it's, it's quite striking really, if, you, if you're, you know, if you're involved in the, the field of consciousness studies, there are so many researchers now who are turning away from the, the idea that the brain produces consciousness and looking for alternative explanations. So but what, one theory which, which I'm very partial to is the idea that the brain doesn't produce consciousness, but it receives it. So I think consciousness is like everywhere around us. It's it's a fundamental thing. It's in the space around us. Um, it's within us as our being. And, and I think the role of the brain is not to produce consciousness, but to to transmit it, to pick it up from the, the space around us and to like a kind of radio receiver to receive it and transmit it into our being so that the consciousness around us becomes channeled into us you know and i think you know that happens in every in every life form their brain or their nervous system or the cells they work they, their, their function is to receive and transmit consciousness is the unconscious state a part of that that we're receiving that because this yeah that's a part of it they, yeah. they, they, sorry no I'm confused about how that works. Like, oh well, in, in my view, you know, the consciousness is is out there. It's a fundamental thing in the universe. It's ever around us. But when it becomes channeled into us, you know, it, it kind of it manifests itself in different ways. It, it's a bit like a it's a bit like food. Like you imagine the raw ingredients of a, of a meal. Then the meal gets processed and intermingled, and it comes out completely differently. It's a bit like that. The raw, the raw material of consciousness comes into us. It kind of gets organized into different ways for our, for our mental for our mental faculties. So some of it will become the unconscious mind. Some of it will become the conscious mind. But yeah, there are, there are varying, you know, different aspects of consciousness within us. Has any advances been made towards the study of consciousness with the uh, innovation of the MR uh, MRNI? MRNI, right, right. Has any um, advances been made towards the understanding of consciousness with that i don't think so no i mean i think when brain scans became available a lot of theorists and philosophers a lot of scientists were really excited to think oh now we'll now we'll be able to understand how the right. brain produces consciousness now we'll work out which bits of the brain are involved in consciousness we'll work out you know what happens when a person has a higher state of consciousness or whatever but the results have been sort of quite disappointing and and quite mixed um, and it turns out it's very difficult to identify any part of the brain which which is responsible for any emotion or experience. Like depression, for example, nobody really knows, even now, after so many decades of research, nobody knows which parts of the brain are, are involved in depression. It doesn't seem to stem from any particular part of the brain. 
It's certainly not related to a lower level of serotonin, which people used to assume was the case. I thought that fRMI thing isolated schizophrenia. I could have swore I saw that they were able to isolate certain um, mental illnesses. No? Well, maybe people have claimed that. But often when you look into it in more detail, it's not quite as clear. And there are, there are other people who have a different view. There was a famous study where a, 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 an image of a brain scan was sent to different university departments. They were asked to, to interpret it. And they all had different interpretations. Oh, no kidding. Yeah, so it's, it's all very subjective. And right, right, right. Quite vague. It's all quite vague. So there haven't been any real advances made since the implementation of that brain scan no, thing? I don't think so. Nothing no, earth shattering. No. Uh, I guess the only, the, only, the, the most interesting um, uh, things that have been revealed. I've been. Have you heard about the the brain scans of people who don't have any brains? <laughs> people with no brains. No, I haven't. <laughs> well, uh, to, just to give you an example. There was a there was a French man. He was actually working. He worked as a civil servant for the French government. He had quite a you know good job, quite an intelligent person. But he had um, he started to have a little bit of difficulty walking. So the doctors suspected he may have some kind of neurological disease. Mm -hmm. So they gave him a brain scan and large parts of his brain were missing. There was like empty space in the middle of his brain. Oh my God. Yeah. They found out that he only had about 10% of the normal brain matter of a normal person. And yet he was able to function fairly normally. Well, completely normally. He was a married man with two kids and had a job. So that, that's, that, you know, there are many cases like that where people, have, they literally have massive sp empty spaces where the brain matter should be. So that's interesting. That, that again, that seems to show that the brain doesn't directly produce consciousness, you know, because ah, that that uh, seems to be really good evidence right there. How about yeah. in, in epileptic patients where they split the the brain in half, right? Don't they sever it to stop the um, seizures? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so that's sometimes. Um, yeah, sometimes people. You know, they, they have their left brain and right brain seem to function somehow independently. Right. So, so in some cases, you, you can cover up a person's eye and they're not aware of what they're doing with what the, right. the other side of their brain is, the other side of their body is doing. So that, that's interesting as well. I really like your, um, your thesis about that consciousness is being absorbed, that, that like we absorb consciousness. But it's a little confusing because we, so are we predestined to each absorb a particular consciousness? Because there are what eight billion people on the planet. So mm. like where where does this consciousness lie? Is this God? And is well, this what makes us who we are? Well, it's a it's a fundamental it's a raw material that makes us who we are. It's the essence of us. Right. And it's the same for everybody, it's the same essence out there which which is kind of uh, channeled into us. But mm -hmm. then the essence sort of, um, you know, it's, it's filtered through our own uh, traits and characteristics. Mm -hmm. And maybe, you know, there, there's some influence from previous lives. Maybe we pick up some influences from our previous incarnations. Mm -hmm. And maybe the, the structure of our brains as well, our, our genetic inheritance from our parents. So it all turns out different. We all turn out to be slightly different people, right. even though the raw material is the same. It's the same essence. I mean, that's why in, um, when people have awakening experiences, one of the things they comment on is a sense that everybody is inter interlinked. You know, we, we're all interconnected. Right. We're all essentially the same. And that's because it lit it's literally true. It's the same essence. It's the same fundamental consciousness in all of us. You know, if you, yeah. if you go back, if you manage to contact your essence, if you manage to quieten your mind and get in contact with the essence of your being. That's what you you feel. Didn't they also do like a um, a global meditation and then they did like a scientific study on that and that everybody meditating at once was able to change like outcomes? Yeah, that, that's right. There have been a few studies of that. Like that. Usually, um, usually led by, uh, the I think it's the Institute of Transcendental Meditation. Yeah, I think so too. Yeah, that they've uh, they had certain a certain number of people meditating in different countries around the world, and they've also had studies where a large proportion or a significant proportion of a city's population have meditated. 
and then they've measured crime rates and stuff like that. Right. They found that crime rates decrease. Yes. Yeah, so there does seem to be some sort of that's evidence that we're interconnected. That you know, a certain number of people meditating can affect the human race as a whole. Absolutely. Through our collective consciousness. And what are you? You talk about them in, in your book and break them down, but just to give the listeners a little understanding, what are the uh, four laws of psychological time? The first one. Um, th th these are basically um, common ways in which human beings experience time, common aspects of our perception of time. Um, the first one is simply that time seems to speed up as we get, old, as we get older. Almost everybody says that. You know, we, we have this, um, we, we often say that Christmas comes around quicker every year. But that's the same in that uh, if you go to, say, Isla Islamic countries, they say that Ramadan comes, quick, comes around more quickly year on year. This is a common human experience. Uh, the second one, is that time slows down when we have unfamiliar experiences or conversely speeds up when we have familiar experiences. Uh, we talked about earlier that you know, when we go to foreign countries and or meet new people or learn new hobbies, time seems to slow down. Uh, third one is time speeds up in states of absorption, uh, which, is which is responsible for the idea that time goes quickly when you're having fun. And, and finally, the fourth one is, is the one that's mostly related to my book, Time Expansion Experiences. The fourth one is that time slows down or disappears altogether in, in intense altered states of consciousness. Yeah. I so love those those. Four, four laws, they, they explain pretty much most, you know, our experiences of time in our lives. Yeah, I really like that because it kind of puts things together in a nice little bundle for you to understand. And, and it, it's so true because like, even when I do these interviews, typically they're about an hour or so. And when they're over, they feel like five minutes to me. Yeah, it's strange, isn't it? It's, it's, it's absorption. Yeah. yeah, it's so true. I really love that in your book that you kind of broke that down. So yeah, um, tell us about your, your classes, because I, I looked on your website, which is um, stevetaylor.com. I'll have that as well as other information in the description of this video. So if folks want to purchase your books and look at your classes, they'll they'll have the links for that as well, Steve. Mm -hmm. um, tell us about your classes, what you teach, what you offer to folks. Um, at the moment, I'm teaching um, a six-week, well, it's, it's about to start in September, a six-week online course based on my previous book, The Adventure. It's a, the course is a practical guide to spiritual awakening where I guide people through the qualities that emerge in spiritual awakening or in awakening experiences. We cultivate those qualities through meditation or through, through other kinds of exercises. And the idea is that by cultivating those qualities, we cultivate spiritual awakening itself because spiritual awakening is those qualities. And those qualities are, are things like gratitude, uh, acceptance, uh, presence, and so forth. So that's my, that's my online course. I also teach courses at my university in, in more academic areas like consciousness studies and uh, transpersonal psychology. Oh, I'm going to sign up for that course. When does it start in September? It starts on September the 22nd. That I really want to take that. It's It really piqued my, my interest. Oh, great. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, so yeah, the information is on my website. So yeah, just... again, I'll have the links to that. Is this by Zoom? How do you teach these courses? Or yeah, it's, it's on Zoom. It's it's um, a weekly session of about 90 minutes on Zoom. And then the video is available. If people can't make the actual session, there's a recording. Oh, nice. Are they interactive where people can ask you questions during the class? Or Yeah. That yeah, that's right. We have about an hour of exercises with me talking, and then we have about half an hour of questions and discussion. Wonderful. How do you work out the time uh, for folks that, you know, like I'm in, not in the UK. So yeah. how, how do you work out the time frames for that? Well, I, I have it quite, I think, I think it's um, 6 p.m. in the evening here in the UK. So in the US, if you're in Eastern Standard Time, that's yeah. 1 p.m. If you're in Pacific Time, it's 10 a.m. So it's, it sort of suits everybody. It's not too bad. Yeah. So you kind of found a middle ground that would work. Yeah, it's, on, it's on a Sunday as well. So it's you know, it's a, oh, not, good. not a day when people are working. Good, good, good. So um, you have this new book, 
that's due out very shortly. What else are you working on? Your life intrigues me. Your work intrigues mm -hmm. me. I find it amazing. Uh, I think I'm going to be your your number one fan moving forward because I'm going to read Brilliant. all your books. <laughs> um, oh, it's great. I love it. Um, what are you working on next? What What's in the future for you coming up? Um, I'm, I'm always writing poetry. Usually when I'm not writing a book, I'm writing poetry. So I'm writing, writing quite a lot of poems at the moment. I write kind of poems about nature or about spiritual experiences. Um so my, my next book may be a book of poems. And um, after that, I'm planning a book on my my philosophy. You know, the, the idea the idea that consciousness is everywhere around us and the brain is a transmitter of consciousness. I'm going to write a book specifically about that. It's a philosophy I, that I call pan-spiritism. The idea that spirit is everywhere and it's the essence of the universe and our own beings are made up of spirit and uh, we're all interconnected and that's why we can feed each other's pain or that's why we're affected by each other's emotions because we're all interconnected. So why do you think that some of us are a lot more empathetic than, than others? Like, what do you think account? Is that just the, your DNA, your personality? Maybe to an extent, but I, but I think the, the fundamental thing is that some people have strong ego boundaries and other people have soft ego boundaries. So some people, if you've got strong ego boundaries, you, you feel a strong sense of separateness. You're kind of in here right. and the rest of the world is out there and you don't, you don't feel connected to other people. In, a, in an extreme way, that can lead to psychopathy or narcissism, narcissism when you're so separate that you're, you oh, don't yeah. care about other people at all. You just use other people for your own devices. Right. But if you have soft ego boundaries, then you do feel connected to other people. You know, you, you, you're not trapped inside your own mental space. You're kind of, you, your, your identity kind of spreads out and connects with other people so that you can sense other people's pain. You can sense their happiness. You feel a desire to help them because yes. you can sense their pain. So that's that's the essential difference that some I people like have that. strong ego boundaries. That makes so much sense. And I think it works that way with animals too, that we, some of us can really connect with with animals a lot more than other people. That sounds fascinating. Yeah, we say with children, so some people really connect with children because right. you know, other people are kind of indifferent and you know, you know, know, don't really care about children or can't really communicate with them, but other people have a natural playfulness because they can connect with children. Right, and, and lastly, I know we're approaching the hour. What do you think is accounting for this surge in spirituality that we're seeing since, you know, I mean, a lot of people are saying it's after like 2020, the past like four years, there are so many more baptisms and coming to Jesus. And not only that, just spirituality, mm. discovering, um, you know, the spiritual side of their nature. What do you think is accounting for the upsurge in this? Mm. It's really interesting. Yeah, I think it has been intensifying in recent years, but I think it's been kind of growing, you know, over the past few decades I think even in my lifetime, it's it's grown a lot. I can remember thirty years ago. I mean, I, I don't remember seeing uh, mind, body, spirit sections in bookshops. Right. I remember I was interested in spiritual topics then, but I found it quite difficult to find books in bookshops. But now there's big sections on mind, body, spirit, and there are meditation courses and meditation centers everywhere. So it, it is it has been a big change, and I think. Um, you know, I, I believe that there is a kind of evolution of consciousness underway. I believe that the human race is collectively moving towards a spiritual awakening and that this interest in spirituality is, is a manifestation of that. And maybe it's because there's maybe it's also because there's a lot of, there are a lot of crises in the world. Yes. But people always grow in the face of crises. It's like if you're as an individual, if you're diagnosed with a serious illness, you suddenly get serious and you suddenly start to take life much seriously. You suddenly start to appreciate things and it gives you a really heightened sense of perspective. In other words, it brings you spiritual growth. Right. I think that's the same, you know, I think we're becoming more spiritual in the face of the crises we're facing. So do you think the pandemic kind of just made like a bump in that? In, in, because mm. a lot of people say that after the pandemic, they started to have like this... Yeah, yeah. There's a concept in psychology that which is called post-traumatic growth, which is, as it suggests, trauma brings growth. 
in the long term, even if it takes a few years to manifest itself, when we go through difficult, challenging situations, it helps us to grow. It deepens and strengthens us. And I think, yeah, the pandemic was a, it was a collective trauma for the whole world. So I think it's inevitable that it has led to some growth. It's made us more serious, made us more spiritual. Yeah, I agree with that. Mm. Thank you so much, Steve. This was fascinating. I really love your work. And I I, I have your second book lined up that I'm going to read, The um, Adventure, I think it's called. And yeah. I, I, I recommend this book highly to everyone. And of course, I'll have links, like I said, to where people can. I'm sure it's available on Amazon as well as on your yeah, website, that's right. right? Yeah. And I'll yeah. have all the links below in the description where people can reach out to you. I hope we can do this again at some yeah. point because I have a lot of questions that I didn't get a chance to ask you. So mm -hmm. uh, if people leave comments, I'm sure maybe we could save them for the next time we speak as well. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you. Yeah, so thank you very much. much. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I look forward to seeing you again. Thanks, Caroline. Thank you, dear.